Good morning, everybody. It's good to be with you. Excited to be with you this morning. Honored that I get uh, to kick off something uh, new with you that we're going to be doing here at the church uh, over the summer. We're going to approach Scripture a little bit differently, and um, Pastor Josh uh, and our, our leadership have gotten together, and they've been wrestling with it for a little bit to try to figure out which book of the Bible that we would begin to unpack together collectively as one big family. And so I know they were, you know, hanging out with the Lord and trying to figure it out, and they ended up settling on um, an incredible book. It's actually one of my favorite books, actually, um, and it's uh, the book of Ephesians. And uh, it's going to give you a little idea of what we got cooking over the summer months. <laughs> Hi, I'm Holly. I'm Caleb. Joshua. I decided to open up my own agency. I'm a lawyer. I'm a colorist in the fashion industry. Some days I've helped out in our lumber mill. I'm a professional boy wrangler. I work in commercial real estate. I'm a seasoned human resources professional. Yeah, I am a baseball fan. And I lost the house that I cherish. A typical day is waking up next to my wife. Couldn't get her out of my head. <laughs> I'm the tallest person in my family. I like to make comic books. I got a tattoo of a tree. I love, I love that. Yeah, so that's all I think about. Who do you think? Who do you think you are? So that's what we're going to be looking into. That's what we're going to be working towards. And the book of Ephesians will be able to help us unpack who we are as individuals, but also collectively as one big family. How's that sound? Does it sound good? Oh my gosh, that was weak and lame. All right. Does that sound good? Yeah, we're going to dive into the Word. Now, if you've never done that before, what we're, our approach is going to be is more of a, and some of you that are Bible scholars and your studiers, uh, an exegetical type of way. Now, when I say that, some people freeze up and they start getting tense. Please. It it's just simply means a systemized, critical look or interpretation, meaning we're going to look and fine-tune, we're going to look at the details, we're, we're going to look, how many of you took macroeconomics? How many of you were brave enough to go microeconomics? Wow, you guys are all stars. <laughs> I failed out of that one, but I tried, I gave it a good college try. Um, but macro meaning big, wide, large, right, micro kind of zooming in a little bit more and getting into the details. And that's what we're going to do through all these uh, different books. I was uh, uh, in the back, and I got to see what the other books after Ephesians will be. So if you want to cheat and get ahead, just go in there when Pastor Josh isn't in his office and take a look, and you'll be ahead of the game. All right? Okay, so we're going to dive into it this morning. Now, it can be really overwhelming. There's a lot of crazy cool stuff that took place in the book of Ephesians, and I love it because this is why you artists out there need to keep drawing uh, and writing during service because the Holy Spirit will give you inspiration, and this pops out. Um, this is what we're going to be tackling. So we want to look at it from a broad sense starting out, and the beautiful thing about Ephesians is it's a multicolored message or letter. And in this letter, Paul is filled with multiple wonderful head-up reminders of who the church really is and who she is to become. And we are a part of this beautiful bride that he is coming back for. Can I get an amen? amen. Boom. So I'm elated that I get the honor of opening us all up to this and particularly chunking out Scripture in this letter and in this book to answer the question, who has God called us, his church, to be in him? Amen? So let's pray, because if I do this, I'll jack it up, but if the Holy Spirit's here, we'll be okay. All right, Heavenly Dad, we come before you and just ask that, God, I would be able to communicate and relay your heart and it wouldn't be about me at all, but it would be all about you and your word and your messaging. That, God, that you would soften the hearts this morning and you would uh, minister to us in a way that only you can. So that, God, everybody that walks out of here this morning, including myself, is just a little bit different. And I'm a little bit more like you, Jesus, than when we walked in. And we ask that in Jesus' precious and holy name. And all God's kids said, 
Amen. All right. So I have this unique thing that I do. I have my own business. I work with people. I help tell their stories. And I get to shoot commercials. And some of those commercials are 30 seconds and 15 seconds. And we've been starting. Check this out. This is crazy. Did you know that the average human being has an attention span of a goldfish? Can I tell you as a marketer how difficult that is to figure out what you're going to say? They have six-second YouTube commercial slots. What do you say in six seconds? <sighs> it's so hard, right? It is so tough, but that's the industry standard. So you start to take, you know, uh, storytelling ability and, and you start chopping it down and you're not allowed to use super long shots and imagery. You have to kind of shorten it down. And so when we're helping and sitting down with a client to figure out what their story is, it can sometimes be difficult. If you got more time, it's a little bit easier. You got a shorter amount of time, you got to be more precise and to the point. Um, because our attention spans are short and sweet, we have to get punchy and we have to get to the point. And what I can't stand, and I know that this probably happens to many of you, but have you ever gone to the movies and if you miss certain parts of the beginning of the movie, you're jacked up for the rest of the movie? And you become that annoying person that leans over and says, is she the one that he's with? And you always get that. <sighs> you got to catch stuff at the beginning if you're going to enjoy the movie, right? If not, you can get all messed up. So what I love is that there's an art form to movie making, especially in the first two to three minutes. How many movie lovers are there? Okay. Me and my family, I don't care what anyone says. I don't care how old you are. The Incredibles are off the hook. <laughs> Incredibles 2 is coming out, just so you know. And guess where our family will be? We'll probably drop a whole lot of money to have a lot of popcorn sitting in maybe the sixth row right in the center, and we'll beat everybody there for Incredibles 2, right? Po movies are powerful. Storytelling is powerful. And what I love is that when it's done well, you can hold an audience of a six-year-old right up to a 91-year-old, right, with effective storytelling. Well, it just so happens that we serve the God of storytelling. He's a great storyteller. And this letter is a great story. But movie-wise, I want to give you an example when you have someone that's really good at storytelling, they're able to take the openings of movies and suck you into it. In the opening of a movie, they have a lot to try to cover in a short amount of time. Their goal is to cover plot. Who's the bad guy? Who's the good guy? Where's the twist? Did we get their names in there, right? And there's a lot of credits giving out. There's a lot of credits at the back end of the movie as well, right? But if you're really good, you can do it in two to three minutes and hold the attention of a viewing audience between 6 and 91. Kind of like we're going to go old school. The Goonies. <laughs> So as we're watching this, ask yourself, where is the setting of this story? Where is it all unfolding? Well, they shot this movie in Astoria, Oregon. You ever hear of it? Here it comes. Right now, you can see there's main characters because they're coming right out of the gate. And some of this stuff we had to chop up because it was totally inappropriate for a Sunday morning. But you can see who the main characters are. You get a vibe for the story. You can start to see the interconnectedness and the intertwining. You begin to know who the antagonist is real fast. And then we're introduced to some unlikely heroes. But what I love here is you see the cop chasing all the way through the city. And then we're introduced here. Oh, to just a bunch of 80s looking teenagers. Yes. Remember her? How many of you remember her? Ah, that's right. We just dated ourselves. Oh, boy. 
you're going to recognize some other faces in here. Now, if you are under the age of 30, 35, this looks very strange to you. Old. I get it. Now, look what they did here. Beautiful shot. Car chase scene, and boom. The reason why we're showing you all this is because you're going to see a name pop up and you're going to understand why this is done so well. Now, it looks old, but it was done really well because there was a big fancy schmancy guy by the name of Steven Spielberg that was a part of making Goonies. Hey, there's one of our unlikely heroes. And I love this guy. He's one of my favorites. He was never really good with his technology, but he had a great heart. And who remembers this guy right here? Oh, yeah. And we had to cut it because he kind of have bad words in his mouth all the time. And how could you miss the rock in the background? So... Again, painting the setting for us all. And then there's Steven Spielberg, right? Steven Spielberg and all of his movies, because he's a master storyteller, was able to do this in two to three minutes at the very beginning of his movies. He's an absolute brilliant mind, good at what he does. How many of you would say, you're right, Jason, he is pretty good? How many of us have spent a lot of money watching his movies? Yes, we've made him a very rich man. The goal this morning is to do exactly the same thing, but not with silly, made-up heroes, but with real heroes, real people chosen by a real God who's, like Pastor Todd said, madly and passionately in love with us, with real church of present day now. It's imperative that as we break down this letter that we're going to look at, this, Paul, that this letter that Paul wrote, is that we do the same thing as we would a movie, break down the critical points that surround this thing so that we can better understand and soak out of it all the spiritual nutrients that are in there. But in order for us to do that, sometimes we have to go back like to some of us that were in college. We got to go macro level and then we got to go micro level. So today the goal is to get a little bit of macro, a little bit of micro, and then dive a little bit with the rest of our time to see what the scripture actually reads. Does that sound good? Does that sound good? Okay. All right. Cool. Good, good, good. All right. So what I want to do is I want to show you a macro level. Hang with me as we watch this. It's so well done. And might I add, if you have the Uversion app, you will find all these types of videos in your app. You're welcome. Paul's letter to the Ephesians. The story of how Paul came to the city of Ephesus is really interesting. You can go read about it in Acts chapter 19. Ephesus was a huge city. It was the epicenter of worship for most of the Greek and Roman gods. And for over two years, Paul had a really effective missionary presence there, and lots of people became followers of Jesus. Years later, after being imprisoned by the Romans, Paul wrote this letter. The movement of thought in the letter divides into two really clear halves. In the first half, Paul is exploring the story of the gospel, how all history came to its climax in Jesus and in his creation of this multi-ethnic community of his followers. The second half of the letter is linked to the first by the word, therefore. And here Paul explores how the gospel story should affect how we live every part of our life story, personally, in our neighborhoods and communities and in our families. So let's dive in and we can see how Paul develops all of this. Chapter 1 opens with a beautiful Jewish-style poem where Paul praises God the Father for the amazing things that he has done in Christ Jesus. From eternity past, the Father has purpose to choose and bless a covenant people. And think here, the family of Abraham and Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. And through Jesus now, anyone can be adopted into that family. Jesus' death covers our worst sins, our worst failures, and in Jesus we find God's grace. In fact, Paul says, that grace has opened up a whole new way for us to understand every part of our lives. 
He says in chapter 1, verse 10, that God's purpose was to unify all things in heaven and on earth under Christ, which is a title that means Messiah. God's plan was always to have a huge family of restored human beings who are unified in Jesus the Messiah. This divine purpose became clear, Paul says, when we were first made into that family. And here he's referring to ethnic Jews in the family of Abraham. But then Paul talks about how you, and here he means non-Jews, you all heard about Jesus and the salvation through him. And you were also brought into this family by the work of the Holy Spirit. And so here he's referring to the events told in the stories of Acts about how God's Spirit brought together Jew and non-Jew into one family in Jesus. It's just like God promised to Abraham long ago. Notice also how in this poem, Paul begins by talking about God the Father, but then about Jesus the Son, and then he here at the end about the Spirit. All three work together as Paul tells the story of the gospel. It's really cool. After the poem, Paul responds with a prayer. He prays that these followers of Jesus would not just know about but personally experience the power of the gospel, that they would be energized by the same power that raised Jesus from the dead and placed him as the exalted head of the whole world. Now in chapter 2, Paul goes back and he elaborates on some key ideas from the poem in chapter 1, especially God's grace and this new multi-ethnic family of Jesus. He begins by retelling the story of how these non-Jewish Christians came to know Jesus. Before hearing about Jesus, they were physically alive, but they were spiritually dead. They were trapped in a purposeless life of selfishness and sin, and they were deceived by dark spiritual forces of evil. But amazingly, God in his great love and mercy, he saved them, he forgave all of their sins, and he joined their lives to Jesus's resurrection life, and he's brought them back to life too. And so now, having been created as new human beings through Jesus, they have the joy of discovering all of the new calling and purposes and tasks that God has set before them. Not only have they been shown God's grace, they've also been invited into a new family. Before hearing about Jesus, these non-Jewish people, they were not just cut off from God, they were cut off from his covenant people, the family of Abraham. And for a really practical reason, the commands of the Sinai covenant, they formed like a boundary line around the family. They were like a barrier that kept most non-Jewish people away. But in Jesus, the laws of the Torah have been fulfilled and the barrier is removed. The two ethnic groups have become, as Paul puts it, a new unified humanity that can live together in peace. So Paul goes on in chapter 3 to marvel at the unique role that he got to have in spreading this good news to non-Jewish people. And even though he's in prison, he's thanking God for the chance he's had to see this covenant family grow so huge. So Paul closes the first half of the letter with another prayer. This time he prays that Jesus' followers would be strengthened by God's Spirit to simply grasp and comprehend the love that Christ has for his people. The second half of the letter begins with Paul shifting gears, and he starts challenging the reader to respond to the gospel story by how they live their own life story. So he starts in chapter 4 with just the everyday life of the church. The church is a big family with lots of different kinds of people, but he emphasizes that they are one, and one is a key word in this chapter. They are one body that's unified by one spirit. They have one Lord with one faith. They have one baptism. They believe in one God. That's a lot of unity. However, Paul says unity is not the same thing as uniformity. He goes on to explore how Jesus' new family consists of lots of very, very different kinds of people, but they're all empowered by the one Holy Spirit, each using their unique talents and passions to serve and to love each other and to build up the church. And here he uses two really cool metaphors. One is building up the church as a new temple, and the second is that they are all becoming a new humanity with Jesus as the head. And this new humanity is a metaphor he's going to then run with for the next couple chapters. Paul challenges every Christian to take off their old humanity, like a set of old clothes, and to put on their new humanity, in which the image of God is being restored. And he then goes on into this long section where he compares this new and old humanity. So instead of lying, new humans speak truth. Instead of harboring anger, they peacefully resolve their conflicts. Instead of stealing, new humans are generous. Instead of gossiping, they encourage people with their words. Instead of getting revenge, new humans forgive. Instead of gratifying every sexual impulse, new humans cultivate self-control of their bodily desires. Instead of getting drunk, 
new humans come under the influence of God's Spirit. And he spells out what that influence looks like in four different ways. The first two have to do with singing, singing together, but also singing alone. And this is really interesting that the first thing that Paul thinks of about how the Spirit works in the lives of Jesus' people is singing and music. The third sign of the Spirit's influence is being thankful for everything. And the fourth is that the Spirit will compel Jesus' followers to put themselves underneath others and to elevate others as more important than themselves. And Paul actually expands on this fourth point by showing how it works in Christian marriage. So you have a wife who follows Jesus. She is called to respect and to allow her husband to become responsible for her. And the husband is called to love his wife and to use his responsibility to lay down his selfish agenda and to prioritize his wife's well-being above his own. And Paul says it's this kind of marriage that's actually reenacting the gospel story. The husband's actions mimic Jesus and his love and his self-sacrifice. The wife's actions mimic the church, which allows Jesus to love her and to make her new. Paul then applies the same idea to children and parents as well as slaves and masters. Paul closes out the letter by reminding these Christians of the reality of spiritual evil. These are beings and forces that will try to undermine the unity of Jesus' people and to compromise their new humanity. And so Paul challenges them to stand firm and to put on this metaphorical set of body armor, which he describes in detail. And Paul has drawn all of these pieces of body armor from the book of Isaiah and how Isaiah depicted the Messianic king. And so now, as the Messiah's followers, we need to make the Messiah's attributes our own since we make up Jesus's body. Practically, I think Paul means for Christians to begin to form habits, proactively using prayer and the scriptures and our relationships with each other to help us grow and mature as followers of Jesus. And that's the letter to the Ephesians. Very powerful. It's where Paul summarizes the whole gospel story and how it should reshape every part of our life story. How cool is that? Isn't that awesome? <laughs> Macro. So we're going to be able to cover all that over the next, I don't however many Sundays. And what I love is that Josh isn't going to rush it. He wants to go just at a pace that we're comfortable with. And so you can be reading ahead and kind of knowing where we're headed, be able to read ahead and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you and then come in and get even more illumination. So we're really, really excited about that. But that's that 30,000 foot view of where we're headed. Now we're just scratching the surface this morning. We're gonna get halfway through chapter one, if we're lucky, okay? So we're gonna try really hard. But the goal is to figure out and start the conversation on who is the church. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're part of the church. Turn to your other neighbor and say, you look good. That second one was awkward, wasn't it? Yes. (laughs) We're going to do a little bit deeper dive. Uh, We went macro. Now we want to go a little bit micro. Some micro stuff came out in there But it's really good, like as if we were telling a story, we were at the beginning of a movie. We need to talk about the characters. We need to talk about the setting. Who's in there? Who's the antagonist? What's the problem? How is it being solved? We want to touch some of those things. Those are good things to talk about because then as you start to read scripture, you start to realize, oh, that's why he said what he said, right? But let's break some things down. The author of this book is none other than Yeah, the Apostle Paul, the man, the myth, the legend, right? Who happens to be where currently? He's in prison, yeah. So can you imagine, now he had written letters in the past, which many of us, if not all of us, have read at some point, or we've heard of, and these letters weren't so nice letters. Sometimes he was writing letters to the church because the church was so jacked up, they needed someone to smack them and get their attention. This letter was not one of those letters. This letter was meant for encouragement because Paul had a lot of relationships in this place, in this church of Ephesus, okay? So, interestingly, this whole letter 
was written 60 to 61 years after the death of our Savior and the resurrection of our Savior, okay? So Paul has been doing some ministry stuff. In fact, Paul and his boys got together and said, hey, we need to go out and do a missionary trip. And we've read on that, right? Paul sets out, grabs some guys, they go out, and they begin to share Jesus. And this Jesus message, because they were filled with who? The Holy Spirit. Because this happened after the 120 in the upper room. Remember that? 120 in the upper room, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and then they go on these missionary trips, and boy, it was a little cray-cray, okay? There's churches blowing up. This church in Ephesians blows up. Paul starts meeting some of these people and he starts falling in love with them. And so a year after that church is planted, Paul goes, I want to go hang out with them. We got work to do there. So he goes and he moves there and he lives there for three years. Now that's roughly about the time that Pastor Josh and Summer have been with us. And there's a lot of connections in this church and a lot of love. That's what happened with Paul. Got connected, made incredible connections, started doing some great things for God. So he was there long enough to see kind of the feel of that whole city. And I got to tell you, that city, can I be honest with you, was a little grody. And what I mean by that is there was every type of weird religion in that city. In fact, there was this cult that was running around Uh, about this Greek god called Artemis. You ever heard of that? Greek god Artemis? Oh, that thing was messing everybody up. And Paul had to speak in his letters to some of those things. And you actually hear that as we start to read through it. Um, The purpose of the letter, though, check this out. This is so neat. Again, was to strengthen the believers. But It was to let them know that they were headed in a good direction and to help define what the church currently should be and where it should be going. Now, if if it was for the church back then, do you think it's for the church today? Yeah, boy, it is. And that's why those that read uh, this particular letter, they do really well in their walk with the Lord and with each other. Healthy churches read Ephesians. Okay, so that's why we're reading it, right? So um, this letter was also written to overcome that weird, funky cult that we were talking about, and just a little detailed information on that. Uh, A way for a lot of these people, they felt like to gain power, to bring good to their family, was to worship these gods of fertility and rain and safety, Okay, Uh, They would do magical incantations and spells. It just was gross. But Paul writes sometimes in verbiage that lets those people know that used to wrestle with that stuff to set them free to see that the power was no longer in Artemis but in Jesus. Okay? Good stuff so far, right? These are all things. We're telling this story. We're talking about our characters, the surroundings, right? So let's break down. Let's read the scripture together, and then let's break it down a little bit. Can we do that? Is that cool? Can we go um, to the very first chapter? We're going to read 1 through 14. we got to at least get through that, and then when Pastor Josh comes in, he can just take right off and just burn rubber. So, all right. Are you there? Yeah? Let's try it again. Are you there? Okay, good. (laughs) Good. All right, here we go. This is the New Living Translation, so it's going to be a little bit different than what you have. Greetings from Paul. This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. I'm writing to God's holy people in Ephesus who are faithful followers of Christ Jesus. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Verse 3. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we're united with Christ. 
Verse 4, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God had decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. So, we praise God for the glorious grace he's poured out on us who belong to his dear son. Verse 7, he's so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. Doing good so far? Okay, verse 8. He has showed his kindness on us, along with all wisdom and understanding. God has now revealed to us his mysteries with regarding Christ, which is to fulfill his own good plan. And this is the plan. At the right time, he'll bring everything together under the authority of Christ. Everything in heaven and everything on earth. And now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news about God saving you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit whom he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so that we praise and glorify him. Isn't that a great opening passage? So now we know some of the players in the game. We know where Paul is at. We know what he's probably going through. He's writing from a prison cell. That's got to be tough. He gets the letter to the right guy. The right guy delivers it. It's just a lot of work to reach out to this community. But once he does, things begin to help this this particular church. The writings, the penmanship through the Holy Spirit start to help this church a lot. But let's break down what is really said in all of this. And you, as you're reading it, may have picked up on some things. Maybe the Holy Spirit nudged you a little bit. But let's break down the word blessed in that first, in verse number three. Verse number three, again, reads, right? All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. This is so good. All these things fall under blessed. When you do a deep dive research in blessed, in this particular word, it means in Christ we have all the benefits of knowing God. All those benefits are, for the church of Ephesus, but also for us, the future church. Blessed means being chosen for salvation. Being adopted as his children. Forgiveness, insights, gifts of the Holy Spirit, power to do God's will, The hope of living forever with Christ. Can I just tell you that this life is good? But can I just tell you, can I just give you hope? This ain't it. There's so much more than what you see right now. That's exciting. The other day, my kids and I, we were all talking, and um, I don't know if it was Gloriana or our son, but basically he said, you know what? There's colors that we've never even seen before. And I was like, yes. Yes, there are. Because our God's a big God. It falls under the blessed. We have the hope of living forever with Christ. And blessings also refers to heavenly realms. And Paul said this strategically because there was people dabbling in cult-like stuff that was gross and disgusting. But he was saying all of this is found through Jesus. You can't get it anywhere else. Artemis is dead. It ain't even real but it's found in Jesus. We could go through each one. Verse 4, he talks about being chosen. Did you know that we were chosen, pre-selected as his kiddos? I bet you anything, if we took the lid off, I bet you there's so many of you in this room that you had a love for God when you were little and you didn't really understand it. And he was probably chasing you down and tapping on your shoulder and you had this love relationship and you couldn't even develop it, but you knew he was real. Can I tell you why? 
you were pre-selected. He handpicked you. Because he's crazy about you. He's head over heels in love with you. Predestined to adoption in verse 5. Infinite love has God adopting us even when we're outsiders. Do you know what Roman law of adoption and how that worked? Do you know, you know with Roman law, this is crazy. This brother told me this in between services. I'd like, we got to share that. He's like, I know. Roman law would allow you to disown your own children, but you could not adopt a child and disown that child. We're adopted. (laughs) Jason, you don't know how screwed up I am. Don't matter. You're adopted. We can't get rid of you. How cool is that? That's in the scripture. That's in this passage. So Paul comes out of the gate, man. He's got his big boxing glove. He's swinging for the fence because he wants the church to know. Listen, you got to jump through all these hoops, right? You don't have to jump through hoops here. You're part of the family. We could go on and on. Accepted and redeemed in uh, five through seven. Enlightened. We're enlightened because we're God's kids in verse nine. There's all kinds of good stuff in here. But you know what? The one that tops the card is the one at the very end where it starts talking about the Holy Spirit. See, a lot of people say, yeah, but Jason, I mess up all the time. I do all this stuff. It's not pretty. I said, do you, do you love the Lord? Yeah, I love the Lord. Do you get convicted if you mess up and do stuff that maybe you shouldn't? Yeah, I do. That's a good sign. You know that, right? I feel guilty. No, that's called conviction. This scripture says that the Holy Spirit is God's guarantee that we belong to him. Do you know what it means? When you want to go buy a car and it's the really nice one on the lot, you have to put money down so that somebody doesn't snatch it. It's a deposit, right? It's a way of saying, here's my money, I'm coming back. I knew that when I saw my wife, I had to put a ring on it because I was going to lose it. So I put a ring because I wanted her to know I'm coming back. (laughs) The Lord gave us the Holy Spirit. There's conviction because he's coming back. And he's coming back for a church that isn't perfect. That's okay. You can't screw it up because Jesus paid the price. And that's good news. There's a whole lot more in there. You've got the book. You can read it just like we can. Get in there. Read it. And let's come back next week and tear it back open. Okay? But this is just the surface. We just scratched it a little bit. Okay? So you have a connection card. That connection card doesn't have a question this week because we were wanting to give you the question towards the end of the service. And that question today is, who do you think you are? Not in a jerky kind of way, but according to the scripture that we just read, according to our heavenly dad's perspective, not to the trash talkers that talk about you behind your back at work or the family members that cause all the drama. No, 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 no. Who does your dad say that you are? Who are you according to that verses 1 through 14 that Paul talks about? What stood out to you? And write that down. Go ahead. Take a couple minutes.